Well, howdy. howdy. <laughs> Welcome to Cowboy Church today. Glad to see you. Glad you can come and join us for a time of worship and praise. I want to say a special welcome to those who are visiting with us today. I've seen several visitors come in, some uh, for the first time. A special welcome to you. If this is your first time to visit, would you look inside, top left hand corner of your bulletin, find a section that says Welcome Neighbor. Take just a minute to fill that out. Then you can tear it off and drop it in one of the containers in the back. We appreciate you for sharing that with us today. Again, we're glad that you're all here to join us for our time together today. Good morning. Let's give our Heavenly Father a big amen. Amen. Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank you for what he's done. Then we will experience his peace. Now we'll all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and the opening prayer. pick us up, Lord, and you put us on a higher place, Lord God, on higher ground, Lord God, and you lift us up so many times, Lord God, when we need that pick up. Father, I pray this morning that uh, you'll just uh, help the people that are in the hospitals. We want to lift up Lynn Pepito to you this morning, Lord God, and pray, Lord God, that you just do a miracle in his life and help him to get better, Lord. And Father, so many others, Lord, that we, we don't know about, Lord God, that are in the hospitals, but we, we pray for them and we ask that you give the doctors and the nurses wisdom, Lord God, as to how to treat them and take care of them, Lord. We ask a blessing upon them also. And Father, pray this morning as the Pastor Dale brings the word, Lord God, that it'll be what we need to feed our souls, Lord God. And we thank you for keeping us hungry to come, keep coming to Cowboy Church and keep us in that way always, Lord God. And Father, pray for our Just uh, bring workers in, and it'll be a blessing, and little souls will be saved and, and born into the kingdom of God. We thank you for all these things, Lord God, and we ask your blessing upon each and every one of them, and we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus, and we and all of God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Amen.
last week I sang a requested song by George Jones. <laughs> I didn't even know I said George Jones until I watched the YouTube. I wonder why everybody was looking at me a little strange. George Jones was not here last week and did not request that song, and George Jones did not pray for me, but Jural Jones did. <laughs> so, it happens. <laughs>
face to face in wonder out my chains were broken I felt born again Thank you, Joe, for that song. That's a great song. I like that. <laughs> I'm not singing. You can count on that. The blood was presented that covered my sin. That's when mercy walked in. That's a great testimony, is it not? In fact, that's part of what we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Last week, we began chapter 2 in uh, Mark's Gospel. And we focused in on verses 1 through 12. By just a quick review, we saw that four men went to the house where Jesus was staying and carried a paralyzed man on a mat. The house was so crowded they couldn't get inside, so they went up the outside staircase to the roof, dug a hole in the roof, and let the man on his mat down to the floor where Jesus was. Jesus recognized their faith, and he turned to the paralyzed man. But instead of saying, you are healed, he said, your sins are forgiven. Of course, the religious leaders didn't like that. They were offended by that. And then Jesus said, I'm going to prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. And he turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, take up your mat, and go home. And Mark said, the man jumped up and walked through the surprised crowd and went out. The crowd got to see what they wanted to see. Jesus performed another miracle, and they praised God for what they had seen. Now let's move on and read verses 13 through 14 to begin with today. Chapter 2 of Mark, verses 13 and 14. Mark said, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. One of the main lessons I want us to learn in our passage today is this. God has a plan. God uses those folks who are ordinary people, unqualified, but willing. If we are willing, God will use us. Matthew, also known as Levi, was a very despised man. One of the least likely to people of that day to be called to be a disciple. As a tax collector, he was despised by his peers. He was seen as a traitor. People could not stand to be around him. Yet Jesus called this man, despised as he was, to be a personal disciple of his. We know Levi best for the book that he wrote in the New Testament, the book of Matthew. 
a book that most all of us have read at least once and probably several times. Matthew's story reminds us that God has a kingdom assignment for every one of his children. We talked about this a little bit just a couple of weeks ago. Let's look at Matthew's story. Once again, Jesus taught a large crowd there on the Sea of Galilee. And as he often did, he walked along while he was teaching. On this particular occasion, as he was walking, he saw Levi sitting at the tax collector's booth. Jesus called Levi to follow him, and he did that immediately. The Bible gives us no indication at all that there was any hesitation. Jesus said to Matthew, come follow me, and he did. I wonder how many of us could say that same thing. Did we respond in a positive way the first time Jesus called us? Most of us probably did not. It may have been a week, a month, a year, 10 years, 20 or 30 years later before we responded to the call of Christ on our lives. For Mark makes it clear here, Matthew, Levi, responded just as soon as Jesus called him. Now understand that as a tax collector, Levi did not fit the profile that people were expecting for a potential disciple for any respected teacher, especially for Jesus himself. Levi was not the one that people would have chosen personally to follow Jesus. Back then, collecting taxes was a despised profession. People hated the tax collectors even more than they do today. They hated the people who collected their taxes, especially those who were religious Jews. The Roman government set the tax rate for each district. Then they leased out the job of collecting the taxes to individuals from the area. The system was ripe for abuse because those who collected taxes were allowed to add to what the Romans wanted, whatever amount they wanted above that. Then they could keep that amount for themselves. There was little, if anything, that anyone could do. Levi was one of those contractors. He collected taxes, first of all, from the citizens who lived there, but also from merchants who traveled through selling their products. Now, Israel had been under Roman occupation for some time. So the Jews hated the Romans for that to start with. And they also saw that anyone who collected taxes for the Romans were traitors. They owed allegiance to the Romans instead of to their own people. Now this might have been especially true for Levi. Many of the men in that day who were named Levi were named that because they were of the tribe of the Levites who were charged with the responsibility of taking care of the temple. So if this particular Levi had had that job before taking care of the temple and then gave it up to become a tax collector, he would have been hated even more. He would have been despised. Religious leaders taught that tax collectors could make a household unclean ceremonially just by setting foot inside the door. Many of the rabbis taught that it was okay to cheat the tax collectors to get out of paying such high taxes. These tax collectors had no, no friends and no respect. Because of all of this, these tax collectors were despised and regarded as sinners. Now, obviously, Jesus knew all this about Levi. He knew a lot more about Levi than anybody else did, even Levi himself. Even seeing all the bad things about Levi... As Jesus looked at him, he saw something different. He saw the potential that Levi had 
of what he could become if he would give up his position as a tax collector and personally become a follower of Jesus. That's why Jesus called Levi to follow him, because he saw his potential. Mark tells us that Levi was sitting at a tax collector's booth. This was a booth that was set up for the collector to get the taxes, both from the residents, but also from people who were traveling through, selling different kinds of merchandise. And this could have included even those who were selling fish. This was a fishing village of the very common profession back then. So if this were the case, then Levi may very well have known Simon, Andrew, James, and John, and others of these men who were or would become disciples of Jesus. This was likely not Levi's first encounter with Jesus. As we said earlier, as soon as Jesus called Levi, he immediately followed him. That means he abandoned his tax collector's booth, left it behind, and followed Jesus. That means that he walked away from a lot of money. At this point, Levi was probably already quite wealthy. Most all of the tax collectors, if they had been in their profession for any length of time, had become wealthy. That's why they chose that profession. But Matthew, Levi gave up all of that to follow Jesus. When Levi met Jesus, his priorities changed. Go back in your own mind to the time when you first met Jesus. When you first accepted him as your Savior and Lord. Did your priorities change? Did you have different goals, objectives? Were there things that became important to you at that time that had not been before? And there were, were there those things that were so important to you right then, you felt like you just had to have them? You couldn't do without them. But when Jesus took over your life, you were willing to give those things up to follow him. That's the way that Levi was. He gave all of this up to follow Jesus. He realized that money wasn't the most important thing in the world. It wasn't the most important thing in his life. For him, number one priority from this point on was to follow Jesus and do whatever Jesus had called him to do. For Levi, this call from Jesus was a personal, life-changing call. And it demanded a type of commitment that he had never had before. Yet Levi was willing to do all of this to follow Jesus. Levi was called for a specific purpose. As a disciple of Christ, he was called to follow Jesus, to learn from him, and then to spread his word around. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that is your responsibility as well. It is mine to learn from Christ, and then to spread his message around. Now let's read verses 15 and 16. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Sometime after Levi accepted Jesus' call, he hosted a, a big dinner or feast in his house. The Bible doesn't say, but I think it's very likely that Matthew hosted this dinner in celebration of his decision to follow Jesus. This would have been a formal event probably in honor of Jesus himself. On occasions such as this, the guests who were there would recline together on cushions on the floor around a low table. They would generally recline on one elbow, prop up like this, and then use the other hand to feed themselves, to put the food and drink to their mouths. Now, I don't know about you, 
But I'm glad that's not in the way that we eat today. At my age, I don't bend like I used to. And to get down on the floor almost like that and recline on the cushion for the entire duration of the meal and then get up after that could be a challenge. It would be very uncomfortable to say the least. But that was expected. That was the custom back then. That's the way they did it. Now I want you to look at Levi's invitation list. Levi invited Jesus, the disciples he had at that time. He also invited other tax collectors, other people who were known as sinners. This word sinners, we don't know exactly what it meant. It could have referred to those people who were not interested in following the Pharisees' strict standards of ritual cleansing and so forth. It could also have referred to those whose morals were not what they should have been. It could have referred to any number of people along those lines. I'm sure that Levi would have invited his own personal friends, other tax collectors, the group who attended this dinner could have been thieves, robbers, prostitutes, any other kind of, of well-known sinners. These were the scoundrels of first century Israel. That long before Garth Brooks or anybody else sang the song, Jesus and Matthew each could have said, I've got friends in low places. They did have friends in low places, and they were not ashamed of it. Not by any means. Matthew not only had them as friends, but he invited them to come into his house and provided a meal for them. He was simply following the example of his newfound Lord and Master, Jesus himself. So Matthew had no hesitancy about doing that. Mark said that by this time, there were many people who followed Jesus. So it's likely that at this dinner, Levi had some of those who were already following Christ. But it's also very likely that he invited those folks who had not yet begun to follow him. They were still following their own lifestyle, doing what they wanted to do. They were the known sinners of that time. Jesus would have welcomed both groups to come and be a part of that dinner. And when Jesus showed that he accepted Levi, it showed that he would accept others who follow the same profession and other sinners as well. Everybody would be welcome. In the ancient world, sharing a meal together sent out a very important social message. People in that day would very seldomly, if at all, have a meal with someone who was not of their own social status. It was just unheard of. But obviously Jesus was not concerned with social status. He didn't focus on rank or anything like that. So when Jesus ate with Levi and his guests, he showed acceptance. All who would follow him were welcome to come. Regardless of their past, regardless of the baggage that they carried with them, regardless of their qualification, regardless of anything, if they would follow Jesus, they were welcome. Jesus would accept them. Now, in our passage for today, just as we saw last week, the Pharisees got mad. They were upset. They were offended at what Jesus did. These men were those who strictly observed the Old Testament law. They especially focused on holiness and wanting to do anything that they could that would keep them from being defiled spiritually, ceremonially. The Pharisees would never have dreamed of eating a meal in the home of a regular Jewish citizen. Especially if someone who was a tax collector. Because they could not be sure that the food was prepared by their own standards. And since Jesus was a respected teacher, they expected him to follow their beliefs. The Pharisees' desire for holiness is good. We all ought to have a desire to be holy. God has called us to be holy. 
But that desire for them led them to a feeling of self-righteousness. It led them to exclude others. And it was not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. We have to remember that any righteousness that we have doesn't come from within us. Any righteousness that we have come from God himself and he gives it to us when we accept Christ as Savior. It's not because of who we are or what we are ourselves. Jesus did not hesitate to keep company with known sinners. And folks, neither should we. We have to be careful to make sure that when we do that, we influence them for the good and not let them influence us for the bad. Sometimes it goes both ways. Now, let's read verse 17. Mark said, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Remember in their previous verse, these Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples why he was eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus heard that question, and he responded by saying, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This was a common proverb that was used at that time. Unfortunately, you and I may have a tendency to criticize the Pharisees unjustly sometimes. Now, some of that criticism is deserved, it's understood. But I'm afraid that many of us, if not all of us, have a little bit of that Pharisee attitude within us. Often it's too easy to look down at other people if they're not in our same social group, if their morals are what we think they ought to be, then we have a tendency sometimes to think that we are better than they are. Isaiah 64, 6 says that our righteousness, no matter who we are, our righteousness is like filthy rags when it's compared to God's holiness. So you and I have no room to look down on other people. Our responsibility is to pray for them and be a witness to them. We shouldn't let the fences that we put up around ourselves keep anybody from coming to Jesus and joining the celebration that he's invited them to. All people who come to Jesus can become his disciples. And when we realize that, when we recognize that, that shouldn't motivate us to share the gospel with everybody around us. They're all welcome. Here Jesus said, it's the sick who need a doctor, not the healthy. I'm afraid that in church life, sometimes, we have a tendency to keep the spiritual medicine inside the walls of the church among those who might be spiritually healthy. When there are folks all around us who need the medicine that we have in here, but for some reason, we expect them to come find us and get the medicine. Very often, we can look up and we see those reddish-orange big helicopters flying over. Life flights. Going to the scene of an accident where someone is hurt. Going to find someone who is very sick and needs some physical attention, some medicine. You and I ought to be on a spiritual life flight helicopter going out to wherever people are hurting spiritually. For the sick, spiritually, and where they need it. We can't expect them to always come to us. We must go to them. Jesus said, go and teach the nations. He didn't say, sit there and let them come to you. He said, go out and find them. If Christ welcomes everyone to this feast that we're talking about, you and I need to do the same, and we don't need to exclude anybody regardless of what we think about them. They are welcome to come to Jesus, and we need to make sure that everybody has a chance to hear that invitation. In this passage today, Jesus took one of the most despised people in Galilee and called him to be his personal disciple. 
regardless of what he had done in the past, regardless of what he was doing right then, Jesus said to Levi, I want you to come and follow me. I want you to leave all this behind you and follow me and be my disciple. You see, Jesus gladly associated with sinners because he loved them and because he knew they needed to hear his message. That meant that often he had to go to them. He spent time with anybody who wanted to hear his message. The rich, the poor, the good, the bad, the male, the female, the Jews, the Gentiles, anybody who wanted to hear his message. Jesus said, come to me. Listen to my message. I'm offering you eternal life. I'm offering you salvation if you'll just come to me. We should also be friends with those people who need Christ even if they don't seem to be our ideal companions. The story that we looked at today about Levi, Prince Isnuts with two challenges. First of all, reminds us that Christ has a place of service for everyone who's a part of God's family. Everyone. All of us have made bad choices in the past. And we continue to do that even now and we will in the future to a certain extent. But the bad choices that we've made in the past do not disqualify us for service to God in the future when he calls us to do something. The things that we've done in the past might limit us into what we can do in today's society. But regardless of that, God has a plan for every single one of us. You see, what we have to remember is that God's grace, first of all, forgives us from our sins. That's what Joe was singing about a while ago. That's where the blood of Christ stepped in. That's where mercy came in and offered us forgiveness. God's grace forgives us of our sins, but also beyond that, God's grace equips us to serve him. It's been said many times that God does not call the equipped, he equips the called. What does that mean? When God calls you to do something, you may not already be qualified to do that. But God knows that. He will qualify you or enable you to be qualified so you can do whatever it is that God's called you to do. And you don't have to be afraid of trying it. Because he will be with you every step of the way. Again, God has an assignment for all of his people. We can't let shame or regret, or fear, or other people keep us from serving him. Sometimes we may find other people say, well, I know what your life was like before. You can't serve God now. You're just a hypocrite. Folks, God knows our hearts much better than anybody else does. God has saved us. He has forgiven us. Now he wants us to move forward with him. The second thing is, Levi's story reminds us that all people are worthy to be used, not because of who or what we are, but because of whom God himself is. As individuals, we're not worthy, but God makes us worthy because of his grace, because of what he can help us become. You and I must recognize that God can do his work of redemption in every person it will come to him. Nobody is excluded. We should invite those people to come and be a part of this spiritual feast. Jesus wants everybody to come. The Bible says, whosoever will. There's an old hymn that says that. Whosoever will may come. And you and I are in no position to say that somebody else is not worthy of the invitation. Rather, it's our responsibility to invite them. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, God saved us, not by our works, but by his grace. God's amazing grace. Folks, God saves the good, the bad, and the ugly. God's grace is available to everyone who will call upon him. God will use every one of his children who are willing and who will allow him to use them. 
And folks, I promise you, if God can save me and use me, he can do the same for you. He can save you, and he can use you if you would just let him do it. The question is, are you willing? Will you let him do it? Will you first of all let him save you? And then will you let him use you in his kingdom work? That's our challenge for today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace that's offered to everyone who will respond. Thank you, God, that you forgive us of our past and use us in the present and the future. Thank you that your call is for everyone to be saved and to serve you. Father, we pray right now for anyone who is here who has never trusted Christ as personal Savior and Lord. Lord, that right now those people would do that. That they would accept Jesus as Savior and Lord and Master. Folks, if you have never done that, would you do it right now? Would you acknowledge that Jesus is God's Son? He died on the cross for you and was raised again so that you might be saved. And would you invite him into your heart and life? Would you accept him today? You can do that by praying a simple prayer like this. You might say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm one of those scoundrels that we talked about. And I'm sorry for every sin I've committed. And I ask you to forgive me. God, I know that Jesus is your son who died on the cross for me and was raised again. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and into my life and be my Savior and Lord. And right now, I open my heart and life and I accept you. Leaving my past behind, I want to serve you in the future. If you prayed a prayer like that, it meant it from your heart. The Bible says God heard your prayer and answered it and saved you. You want to give him thanks for that. But if you have not done that, would you do it right now as Jackie begins to play? Jackie's playing the old hymn that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. Have you made that decision personally? Are you doing that? The song says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Have you accepted him? If not, would you do that? And would you follow him? Would you not turn back? Would you allow him to use you? No matter what anybody else does or says. Would you be like Levi and make him the number one priority in your life? To do whatever it is he's called you to do. song says, though none go with me, I still will follow. Would you be willing to do that? Even those times when you might be alone. God is with you and will lead you through those times. Would you follow him? She's going to play through one more verse. Spend just a few moments in silent prayer.
All right, thank you for being here today. Glad you could come and be a part of our service. If you made any kind of decision today to accept Christ, join the church, or other decision, there are some green sheets on the table in the back. I ask you if you would pick one of them up and fill it out. Give it to us. We'd like to visit with you about your decision. Remember, again, the Vacation Bible School working meeting right after church today. If you've already signed up or if you're available and can work that day, please stay and be a part of the meeting. We need some more volunteers to help us on July 13th and 14th. What you say now for a closing prayer? Dear God, we want to thank you for this wonderful day that you gave us today to come to your house and worship you. Also, I want to thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for punching my ticket, my one-way ticket to heaven to see you. I hope all the members in this church have had their tickets punched too. Also, we'd like for you to Keep uh, Brother Dale speaking your word to us here at the church. Also, we'd like all the activities that go on around the church here, keep your hands on that too. Make them uh, run well. Also, our country. We need to put your hands on our country. You might guide our leaders to guide our country to become more of a Christian nation instead of being hostile to everybody. Also, we want to uh, put your hands on our children's church that's going on out there. We thank you for all the people that's bringing their children back to church to worship you. Also, keep your hands on us as we go home. Keep us safe in all of in endeavors that we're going to do this next week. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.